in this day of electronic communication, it's always a joy when you get a package or a personal letter in the mail. I love getting letters and notes from people and packages. It's just, just such a blessing uh, when, uh, when somebody takes the time to write a note. Um, college students that uh, get care packages in the mail, that's the best time of the week. What would it be like if God sent you a personal letter? Or maybe what would it be like if God sent the church a personal letter? You know, maybe Janet goes to the mailbox one day and opens up a letter and here it is, letter from God. What do you think he would say? Well, you know, there actually was an occurrence of God sending a personal letter to churches that's recorded in the Bible in the book of Revelation. There were seven letters that God sent to seven churches. Uh, I want you to imagine that you were a part of one of those churches as I read the letter that he sent to the church in the town of Ephesus. Just imagine what, what it would have felt like for you to be a part of that congregation and hearing this personalized letter from God. Let me read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And here's what it says. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write... The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have abandoned your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, there's some very encouraging words in that letter to the church there, aren't there? You know, enduring patiently. You guys can't put up with those who are imposters. Those who are evil, you can't, you you don't give them the time of day. But then he goes on to say, I got this one thing against you. Uh Uh-oh. All right, Lord, brace yourself. What, what is this? You have abandoned the love you had at first. Whoa. Wow. Those are mighty strong words. You know, apparently the Lord was very concerned about this whole love thing. Apparently, God was concerned about this to the extent that the future life of this church was going to ride on whether or not they re-embraced the love that they had for God at first. I think the whole love thing still matters to God today. It matters in His church, Universal, and it matters in, in this church, this local church as well. The most important, the very first and most important command is to love the Lord. But we human beings have a tendency to forget or even, like the Lord said in this letter, to abandon that kind of love. Because our hearts are prone to wander from the Lord, we need them to be revived. We need life breathed into them. We need this kind of love that we had for God at first to be re-entered into our hearts. We need to reacquire our love for Him. And the Lord in this letter gives three steps, and I want to briefly just highlight those three steps for us to take. First one is to remember. Remember. And let me qualify by this by saying, remember how you used to renounce the things of the world 
instead of embracing them. Remember how you used to renounce the things of the world instead of embracing them. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I've read this verse for many years, but one of the new insights that I got this week was that this word world can also refer to age. Do not can be, for, be conformed to this age. The spirit of this age, which turns its back on a loving and holy God. I want to read for you a testimony of a man whose name is uh, Jack Deere. And this is a, a man who came to believe in Christ and came to be a teacher, even at the seminary level, who experienced what it was like to lose his first love for the Lord. I think it's got some insight. Let me read. This is his testimony. Almost any Christian can tell you that the greatest commandment of all is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. We all know this is the greatest commandment, but are we really taking it seriously? It's so easy to think that we are loving Jesus when in reality we're loving something else. He says, When I was converted at 17 years of age, I had no religious or church background of any kind. Immediately I fell in love with the Lord Jesus. I began to devour his word. I talked with him constantly. I witnessed every one of my non-Christian friends again and again. I was so overzealous that I lost all but two of my friends. Uh, this loss didn't affect me that much because I was so in love with Jesus that nothing else really mattered to me. I also loved my new church. In fact, every time the doors were open, I was present. It's a good example of, of this idea of first love that Jesus put into his heart. He had so much love for the Lord that he wanted to, to be around uh, the people of God. He wanted to be as close to God as possible. But then he goes on, he says, after about a year the original passion I had for the Lord Jesus began to fade somewhat. I couldn't point to a day or an hour when it happened, nor could I give you a reason for it, but something was definitely different. The passion that I had had for Jesus had subtly been transferred to my denomination. In our church, we talked a lot of our denomination, how proud we were of it. It became difficult for me to understand why all true Christians wouldn't want to be part of my denomination. I also remember thinking that my church was perhaps the best church in the whole denomination. You ever see that happen anywhere before, right? You, you see where this is going, right? I didn't think that I ever loved my denomination too much, nor my church too much. The problem was that I loved Jesus too little in comparison with my church. Deception like this occurs so slowly and so, so subtly, it is almost impossible to see when you're trapped by it. Eventually, I repented of putting my church ahead of Jesus, and the cold self-righteousness left me, and I fell in love with Jesus afresh. And what, a, what a wonderful uh, testimony of God's grace working in a person's heart. But wait, there's more. Later, I got sidetracked again in my quest to cultivate passion for the Lord Jesus. In the process of getting theologically trained and becoming a seminary professor, I developed an intense passion for the precise study of the Word of God. Before I knew it, it happened to me again. I, find my, I found myself loving the Bible more than I love the author of the Bible. I was caught in this trap for more years than I like to remember. Again, the problem was not that I loved the Bible too much. It is that I loved Jesus too little in comparison to the Bible. So whenever we love someone or something more than we love Jesus, then our priorities are out of place here. The first command is to love God. The next command is to love our neighbor. He goes on, I had put the Bible over the Lord Jesus, much like the Pharisees had put the law and their traditions above God. It is possible to make this mistake with almost anything. We can put other people or even various forms of ministry, even witnessing, caring for the poor or praying for the sick, above the Lord Jesus. I've often seen people confuse loving Jesus with doing ministry. It's even possible to love the Christian life more than loving Jesus. There's a sense of security and purpose 
that comes from being surrounded by Christians and having a lifestyle that our friends approve of. Christian fellowship is wonderful, but some have more for affection for that than for Jesus himself. The spirit of this age, the age that we live in, gets this priority mixed up. And loving other things over our love for God can subtly come in and creep into our hearts and grab hold of us before we even realize it. And so we need to remember. The Lord says to us today, as he said to the the Ephesian church, remember the love that you had at first for Jesus. Now the second step that Jesus tells us to do is to repent. Repent. And that simply means learn how to say no to ungodliness. And let me read uh, from Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 14. This puts a fine point on learning how to say no to ungodliness. Okay, listen closely. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness. Isn't that cool? Worldly passions and live up Uh, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must learn how to say no to the things that would pull us away from God. It doesn't happen automatically once you trust Christ and you believe in Him. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to learn that. That's the process of discipleship, growing in the grace of God. Because the grace of God appears. It's God's gift to us. And when we receive that gift, it's a tremendous change. It's a, it's, it's, it's a cataclysmic change in our lives. But we're still so caught in the patterns and the habits and the spirit of the age around us. We must learn how to reject the things in this life when they raise their head above the treasure and the beauty and the glory and the awesomeness of who God is. And that takes some time and that takes some learning. And, and the great thing I love about this is that, um, did you notice that it's the grace of God that teaches us? It's not human ability that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Did you get that? It's God's grace. It's His gift that draws us to say, you know what, I don't want that anymore. I've got something better. To know and to follow Jesus, it teaches us, it's His grace that gives us. It's the grace of God that trains us to live godly lives. You know, human uh, training certainly accomplishes a lot of things. Uh, There are some tremendous feats. I was amazed at this guy that broke the marathon record under two hours to run 26.2 miles. Now, as a person that's actually run a marathon, this is even more amazing to me. I ran it in four and a half hours, which I thought was a good time. Two and a half hours faster than me is how fast this guy. I can't even, I can't even fathom that. The average uh, mile pace that you have to run to do that uh, is four Four minutes and 34 seconds per mile. That's the average. Now, just to put a fine point on this, the fastest mile ever run by a human being is three minutes and 43 seconds. That's only like 45 seconds faster. That's the fastest ever. And you have to do this for 26 miles in a row. That's an amazing feat. It's amazing. But you know what? As amazing as human beings are, abilities are they pale in comparison because here's the truth no human being can cause our dead hearts to become alive not one human being could do that except for christ jesus by his death and his resurrection on the cross he was able to do what we couldn't do ourselves and this is why we are so grateful to him and we glory in what he's done because he has done what no other human being could possibly do in all of history and he's done it because he loved us so much now the next step and final step is to return we need to remember our love for jesus we need to 
repent and turn away from the things that keep us from, from our love for him. And, and the third point is return through worship and obedience. How do we return to this relationship with God of love? We to return through worship and obedience. Now, when you wander off and become lost, like Waldo does often, it's time to come back home. Now, since Jesus is for everyone who, who's in Christ, everyone who believes in Christ, Jesus is our home. We have to come back to him, to the heart of our worship for him and obedience. As, as we sang, um, uh, worship is more than bringing a song. Worship is we recognize how awesome Jesus is. And that can certainly happen any time or any place. However, to neglect worshiping together with God's people is a major stumbling block. This really is one of the biggest lies of this age that Satan has done, the major stumbling block in the church is the neglecting of worshiping together as a body. And, you know, Hebrews says it very specifically, do not neglect the worshiping together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the evil one, he has driven a wedge into the body of Christ by lying to us and saying it doesn't matter. You can go worship wherever you want on your own. It does matter. God has called us to be a family together and to worship together because we need each other. And so we re- need to return to Him, not just in our own personal worship, but our corporate worship, our worship together, and make that a priority and value that highly because without that, we can be driven away uh, from our heart and our passion for the Lord. When, it's, when we wander off, it's because we have chosen, perhaps ever so subtly, to compromise and to not do what the Lord has called us to do. And you know that once you, once you make a compromise, the next one is a lot easier to make. You ever never notice that one? And then the one after that, is, is, it's like, oh, no problem. And so when, when we have wandered off and we've made those compromises, then we need to, first of all, acknowledge where those are, and then we need to come back to the heart of worship, which is all about Jesus. Not to worship our church, not to worship a person, not to worship some style, not to worship worship music, not to worship the Bible. We worship Jesus. So we need to return to that purity of devotion to Him. Rather than starting out by saying, hey, I got to get back to doing what is right. Let's start by coming back to the heart of worship, which is all about Jesus. Come back to him, right? That's, we can't be good without him, and yet we try so hard to, right? So let's start where he has told us is obedience, and that is in our love for him. That's where it starts. The first step is to recognize when we've wandered away from loving Christ with our heart. And when we agree with God about the status of our heart, then we're ready to turn around from other things that have cropped up in our life and turn back to Him to experience a renewed love and affection. Then we must guard it and cultivate it. Or again, we will experience the creep of the world which tries to drive a wedge between us and the Lord. This is where we must ask the Lord to renew us in the love for Him which is greater, far greater than anything else. As a practical step for returning to our first love in the Lord, we will renew our devotion and dedication to God through the celebration of the Lord's Supper this morning together as a church family. As you take communion, I encourage you to do a few things. I encourage you, first of all, to remember what your heart was like when you first saw Jesus for the tremendous treasure and the beautiful awesomeness that he is and the glory that he is. Remember what that was like. As you take communion this morning, as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, I want you to think about that. Think about how Jesus himself was what drew you to him, that love for him. As you take communion, I also encourage you to renounce those things that stand between you and the Lord, the things that grab your heart, the things that are pulling you and drawing you away from how awesome he is and how much 
I, I encourage you to take this opportunity to just say, no, I don't want it. I was thinking this morning as I was going over uh, the, the message, there are some things when we come to Jesus that he automatically cuts off in our life. Praise God. We have no problem with anymore, right? Anybody uh, relate to this? When I came to him, there are certain things that like, no, I don't have, I'm not even thinking about that. I don't need to. And there's some things that you've got to wrestle down every day, right? Do you know what I'm saying? There are some things in our life that teaching us to say no how to, uh, to ungodliness is teaching us how to fight the good fight of faith and to do spiritual warfare every day. And instead of saying, no, I don't want that, you've got to take, no! No way! That's what you've got to do. You've got to learn how to be a spiritual warrior and say, that's not me, I don't want it, and you've got to say no, Right? I mean, isn't that part of it? Sometimes it's, no, I don't need it. I, I don't want it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's like, you better get out of here. I'm gonna, you know. Mm. I know you understand what this is. You, you know, you, I, I get this. And sometimes we get overwhelmed. Today, today, I think there's some grace in here for us to turn around and say, you know what? I'm going to take another stand. Maybe this, this, these things that keep me from the Lord... Maybe those things that have gotten in my way, they've had too much, too much time and attention in my heart. Today, God's going to give me grace to say, no, get out. Amen? Amen? I don't want them. You don't want them. Let's do it together, huh? As we're taking communion, I want to encourage you to, to say no to these things that are grabbing at your heart that are in between you and Jesus. Now, in preparation for this time of remembering and repenting, Will you also return to the priorities which God has placed in your life? For those who have made a covenant with each other as covenant members of this church family, there are those things that God has called us in love and obedience to. There are our, our, our uh, priorities that he's placed in our life. Will you now reaffirm with me these covenant promises and declarations as a part of the Lord's call to return to the priorities that you have agreed to as a member of the church family. Now, if you're not a covenant member of the church family, and as we read through these things, there, there are things that pull at your heart and you say, you know what, I, I want to, these are things I declare too, these are things I want to affirm too, and you're not a church member, talk to me later. But, but um, if these are true for you, then we want to affirm these things together because part of returning to obedience to Christ is to reaffirm those things that we have agreed to and we have declared that we want to live by. And as a church family here, we declare these things as our covenant together.